Good afternoon, Independence Chamber of Commerce lunch attendees. I'm Zach Walker, City Manager for the City of Independence. Sorry I can't join you today, but this event means so much to me every year that I wanted to record my comments for you uh, and share them with you that way today. It's certainly been an abnormal year and this is an abnormal way to appear, but we've all become very adaptable and I appreciate your flexibility today. I'd like to begin by thanking Mayor Weir, Council Members Huff and DeLucy, Perkins and Stewart, Steinmeier and Hobart for their continued leadership on the City Council, as well as our department directors and city staff who represent our city every single day. In the days leading up to the Apollo 13 launch on April 11, 1970, few seemed to care that astronauts Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, and Jack Swigert would soon be arriving on the moon. This had been done twice before, and there were more pressing matters to focus on. Paul McCartney had just left the Beatles. But on April 13th, 56 hours after launch, a piece of faulty wiring in one of the oxygen tanks ignited a spark, and the tank exploded catastrophically. The crew lost two of their three fuel cells in the explosion, and their only remaining oxygen tank began to leak into space. The old plans for landing on the moon were abandoned. The new mission objective was survival. That, in a nutshell, is what the year 2020 was like at the City of Independence. Here is but a sampling of our metaphorical oxygen tank that exploded in the last 12 months. On March 12th, Mayor Weir declared a state of emergency in response to the increasing spread of the COVID-19 virus. Over the next 10 months, our organization would deal with a multitude of issues related, from operating a city with a socially distanced workforce to trying to run public meetings in a virtual setting from providing COVID testing to providing food boxes and balancing public health restrictions with devastating economic impacts. In the midst of all of this, COVID took direct aim at our city staff with more than 10% getting it and dozens more quarantined. We did our best to adapt to working in split shifts or working remotely while striving to provide world-class basic services. The one thing that everyone seemed to agree on was that the only way to survive this was by hoarding toilet paper. And many of us learned we'd make terrible school teachers. In April, the economic realities of the global health pandemic began to set in. We estimated our local sales tax revenue would decline by as much as 21% or $12 million. In response, the city council took the extraordinary measure of approving an interfund loan of up to $25 million to help avoid mass employee layoffs and the cancellation of basic city services. On May 25th, a black man named George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis by a white police officer during an arrest after a store clerk alleged he had passed a counterfeit $20 bill. The officer knelt on Floyd's neck for over eight minutes. This prompted a national conversation and our organization began the process of reevaluating a number of wide ranging policies and practices. The fall brought the 2020 presidential election, which gave the tension surrounding that event, required our public safety teams to plan and prepare for the potential of civil unrest. To fill out the city manager career bingo card, 2020 capped things off in December with an apparent ransomware attack on our city servers. Fortunately, fast thinking city staff noted suspicious activity and took our systems offline, likely preventing more widespread damage. However, the event disrupted our business activities, including delaying the utility bills to our 56,000 customers for over two months. Undoubtedly, our resolve was tested in 2020, but our resiliency was proven every single time. And while we may have adapted our plans like the Apollo crew was forced to do, our planning wasn't futile. As General Dwight D. Eisenhower said, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Consider the following. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we administered nearly $9.6 million in federal funds to address a diverse range of needs in our community, often for the most vulnerable among us. This included financial assistance to pay rent and utility bills, providing food boxes, administering COVID tests, small business assistance, and funding for public transit. Faced with immense fiscal burdens, 
we identified alternatives that helped mitigate the loss of revenue and avoided a single dollar being borrowed from the $25 million loan, which avoided at least $2.5 million in debt service obligations we otherwise would have owed. I'm especially proud to report we did this without a single furlough or mass layoffs, which not only helped sustain the delivery of city services, but helped avoid economic turmoil for our employees. We bravely confronted our organizational practices through the work and guidance of the citizen-led diversity and inclusion task force. The task force compiled 30 recommendations for improved policing practices. I'm pleased to report that the Independence Police Department is in compliance with 25 of these 30 recommendations. We've also formalized the work of the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force into our Human Relations Commission to ensure the meaningful conversation continues well into the future. The popular narrative for 2020 is that it was an abhorrent irregularity and should be scourged from our collective memory. In reality, every generation tends to think of itself as uniquely challenged and under siege. The questions of the present assume outsized and urgent importance, for they are, after all, the questions that shape and fill the lives of those living in the moment. We have managed to survive the crises and fluctuations of the past year. We press onward with the same dogged and pioneering spirit that has always defined independence. And while we have adapted the needs, we press ahead with the plan that has served as our guiding light for the past five years, independence for all. In fact, many notable achievements were made toward items in our strategic plan due to the direct influence of the Chamber of Commerce. Thanks to the Chamber's Quality Housing and Safe Neighborhoods Committee, a proposal is being developed for City Council consideration to revive the Land Clearance Redevelopment Authority to target abandoned, blighted, and vacant residential properties. Thanks to the Chamber's Broadband Committee, the results of a community broadband feasibility study will be shared with the City Council at an upcoming study session, a need which was particularly heightened in the past 12 months. And thanks to the support of the Chamber's Civic Council, $8,000 was contributed toward the $2 million capital campaign for the Inglewood Arts Center with this funding specifically supporting an impressive exterior mural at the facility. In this continued hour of anxiety, we must remember that our brightest hours are almost never as bright as we'd like to think. Our glummest moments are as rarely irredeemable as they feel at the time. While the past year certainly took its toll, it shouldn't deter our enthusiasm. Consider these accomplishments. We have significantly improved our neighborhood code enforcement program. Over 81% of code enforcement cases are inspected within five business days or less. We have seen an 88% increase in proactive code enforcement by city staff. We've reduced the timeline for dangerous building demolitions from 120 days to 40 days. The voter approved use tax is providing $750,000 annually for the animal shelter, as well as $3 million to hire up to 30 new police officers. As of today, we have hired 13 new officers with these funds. Moreover, the use tax is expected to yield an additional $800,000 this year for the original sales tax funds to support things like streets, parks, and stormwater improvements, along with equipment purchases for police and fire. We are finding new and inventive ways to deliver basic services while also reducing our expenses in the face of declining revenues. In the last five years, we've reduced our total staffing by almost 150 employees citywide. Perhaps these efficiencies are most evident at Independence Power and Light, where in the last five years, staffing has been reduced by 63 positions and total operating expenses reduced by $11 million. The City Council has adopted new financial policies to set adequate reserves for Independence Power and Light. Collectively, these actions have resulted in a 6% rate reduction, the early retirement of debt, and a one-time bill credit of about $200 for every electric utility customer. We brought long-term operating and financial stability to the Cable Dahmer Arena through an extension of our management agreement with Spectra that keeps them in place through 2034. Nolan Road, perhaps one of the city's most recognizable corridors, continues to enjoy a renaissance through the efforts of the Noland Road CID. Along the corridor stretching from Truman Road to 40 Highway, there are now 135 active businesses. 12 properties 
that opened in, or upgraded in the last year bring additional vitality to the area, representing private investment of over $7 million. The CID continues to make infrastructure improvements, beautification enhancements, and branding efforts. The city exceeded all growth goals on its social media platforms, doubled the production of video content, and increased viewership of online videos by 70%. This past August, the City Council met to develop the strategic plan for the next five years. After careful reflection, consideration, and deliberation, the City Council chose to retain the same vision, mission, and objectives of Independence for All. Prior to adopting the plan, the City Council surveyed residents and business owners, and 82% agreed that this is the right plan to move Independence forward. The City Council, utilizing the feedback from the citizen survey, has also set the following priorities for the next 12 months. Reduce crime and disorder. Stabilize and revitalize neighborhoods. Reduce blight. Enhance public health. Communicate more effectively. When I look at these five goals, I look at the economic disruption beset by the COVID-19 pandemic, and I see two common themes, market inequality and social detriments of health. Issues of crime and disorder, issues of neighborhood stabilization, issues of blight and public health all have at their core the need to address inequalities that remain all too pervasive in our community. While COVID-19 did not create these problems, it certainly exacerbated a growing divide that already exists within our economy and within our community. Most economists now refer to our economic recovery as being K-shaped. This means that for the wealthy, economic recovery from the COVID-19 recession has largely been completed. For the low-income worker, however, economic recovery remains elusive. Sadly, some of the hardest-hit employment sectors are those that directly impact far too many of our residents. We must prioritize those issues that address these inequalities and social determinants of health and prevent us from living out the powerful purposes of independence for all. It must be our goal to assure that everyone in this community has access to economic prosperity. These are the issues then that I ask the Chamber's support and help with over the year ahead. Number one, diversity and inclusion. In order to be independence for all, we must recognize systemic racism and other discriminating and exclusionary practices in order to secure new legacies for the well-being and justice of all. Why should our business and civic community care about this? We must value and promote diversity because it enhances the business community and the economic development of the region through increasing regional and global business development. Expanded educational opportunities and creating a robust community infrastructure that encourages all community members to make contributions using their special talents, expertise, and knowledge. Need more reason to care? The website maptheimpact.org tracks economic data by congressional district for immigrants. Here, in Missouri's fifth congressional district, immigrants account for about 6% of the population. They paid over $331 million in federal, state, and local taxes and have a combined spending power of nearly $900 million. And when it comes to local policymaking, consider that there are over 17,000 eligible immigrant voters. This is a group that is getting bigger, as evidenced by the fact that between 2010 and 2015, immigrants accounted for 16.5% of the total population growth in our region. We must therefore make definitive and concrete plans to engage this critical sector of our community into our civic fold. Number two, mental health. 2020 certainly left us no shortage of memes and tropes about feeling just a little bit off kilter. But the truth is, there is a growing need to focus on mental health needs in our community. Consider these statistics from the National Association of Mental Illness. One in five adults experience mental illness each year. 43% of U.S. adults with mental illness receive treatment meaning that 57% did not. In 2020, the number of adults reporting anxiety or depression grew by more than 30%. The impacts are far-reaching. From a business standpoint, researchers have found that a single extra poor mental health day in a month is associated with a 1.8% drop in per capita real income growth, 
resulting in $53 billion less total income each year. From a public safety standpoint, an increasing number of both police and fire calls for service involve issues of mental health and have little to do with fire prevention or issues of crime and disorder. The seeds of opportunity were sown in 2020 with the reestablishment of the Independence Health Department, along with receiving a grant in the amount of $750,000 that will fund three mental health co-responders, two at Comprehensive Mental Health Services and one at Rediscover to be embedded with the police departments in Blue Springs, Independence, and Lee Summit. The grant comes as part of our collaboration in the Eastern Jackson County Shared Services Initiative and will undoubtedly help play a key role in addressing a critical need in our community. Number three, housing. We must help build healthy neighborhoods that enable all children and families to succeed and thrive. Too many of our neighborhoods remain plagued by crime, unemployment, poverty, vacant housing, and a lack of economic development. This is a multifaceted issue, but can generally be summarized into two categories. We must continue to attack the backlog of dangerous buildings in our community. As of this January, the city currently has 228 dangerous building cases open. Demolition is our least preferred outcome, as the average demolition costs about $15,000. With a budget of just $130,000, we can only demolish an average of nine to 10 structures per year. Moreover, demolition leaves in its wake a vacant lot, leading to issues like blight, illegal dumping, and crime. Instead, we must continue to develop and promote programs like the Southwest Independence 353 Abatement Program and the Vacant Building Registry Program that the City Council approved in 2020 to encourage the continuous investment in residential properties that will keep our neighborhood strong for years to come. We must also focus on housing instability. My friend and fellow civic leader, Doug Cowan, at the Community Services League has often told me that the best way to keep people in housing is to keep them from falling into homelessness in the first place. Doug will be the first to tell you that it is easier said than done. The Department of Health and Human Services notes that there are five different housing conditions that contribute to the definition of housing instability. High housing costs, poor housing quality, unstable neighborhoods, overcrowding, and homelessness. High housing cost refers to housing that takes up more than 30% of a household's gross monthly income. That is why we must continue to focus on issues like workforce development and economic development to provide a living wage to residents in our community. Again, this was an issue that was exacerbated by COVID-19. The council did its part to help control living expenses by providing $2.2 million in utility payment assistance, suspending shutoffs for non-payment of utility bills and late fees for non-payment, as well as providing $184,000 for rent assistance. Number four, homelessness. It is probably not surprising that in a year of severe economic turbulence, homelessness became an issue front and center on our agenda. In the past year, I had several opportunities to join police officer Matt McLaughlin of the Independence Police Department as he engaged in homeless outreach activities. Officer McLaughlin works relentlessly to build trust with both property owners besieged by homelessness and homeless individuals living on our streets. My eyes were open to a world I drive past every day that serves as the humble homes of far too many in our community. The bridge on Truman Road by Van Horn High School the Woods by Santa Fe Park, and the detention basin behind the Walgreens at 23rd and Lee Summit Road. These are all places that we went to to visit our homeless neighbors. I was particularly taken aback by a man named Paul. We visited Paul at his home, which at one time had been the garden center at the old Kmart on Noland Road. It was a chilly day in late fall, and Paul stated he was running low on food supplies. He repeatedly told Officer McLaughlin that he was fearful that another homeless individual who tried to steal his belongings would come back around, and this had prevented him from getting much sleep. Paul receives a disability check each month of almost $800 from the federal government, but that remains insufficient to achieve stable housing and pay his living expenses. As I wrote these remarks, it was a bitterly cold February day, and Paul's humble abode appeared on the list of dangerous buildings slated to be demolished soon. I wonder about Paul, 
many times a week and others just like him. Our city council is to be commended for the actions they took this past year to deal with the downstream issues like loitering and aggressive panhandling and these actions will surely help reduce crime and disorder and improve the visual appearance of our city. But if we want to get our fellow man out from under the bridges, from deep in the woods, from the abandoned buildings, we must address the upstream issues to prevent problems rather than respond to them. It will take every single one of us working in unison, but I believe this is a problem our city can address. Finally, successful downtown redevelopment. Just shy of three years ago, the City Council unanimously adopted the Downtown Redevelopment Coordinating Committee's master plan focused on strategic planning investment that would leverage private investment, build an active and comfortable core area, create a critical mass of activity, and attract a diverse population. Two years after that report was submitted to the Council, substantial progress has been made on two-thirds of the 48 recommendations contained in the report. Notable highlights include the 24 highway improvements, which will include expanding the existing four-lane section to five lanes, adding sidewalks, better lighting, stormwater upgrades, retaining walls, trees, bicycle facilities, and enhanced transit stops. Additionally, a considerable amount of progress has already been done in the Inglewood Arts District, with much more on the way. The Inglewood streetscape, including new sidewalks, was completed in 2019. The Inglewood CID was successfully formed to provide funding for streetscape enhancements, including street amenities, events, and public art. Improvements to come include the Truman Connect Trail, which will link Inglewood and the square. Plans are also moving forward to convert the former CMHS building into the Inglewood Arts Center. The National Park Service continues planning on a new $10 million visitor center for the Truman Home. The facility will be located on vacant land along Truman Road, adjacent to the city's transit center. Now, our attention turns to the historic Independence Square. This project has been identified as a community priority by 90% of respondents in citizen surveys and is included in the Independence for All strategic plan. The square streetscape and associated trail and cycle track represent two of the top five priorities presented by the City Council by the Chamber of Commerce in April 2017. In addition to new sidewalks, the plan calls for a new traffic flow pattern, improved lighting, and a cycle track through the heart of the square. A plan of funding has been identified, bringing together a variety of sources for a $3 million construction project. 46% of the total project costs will come from leveraged funds. The new square CID will work with the Independent Square Association Square Benefit District and private individuals to help maintain the new streetscape and enhance it with landscaping, street amenities, and art. Promoting civic renewal, community resilience, and individual well-being. These are complex issues that almost certainly will not be solved today or tomorrow or maybe even in our lifetimes, but these are the issues which must be confronted if we are to live out the noble calling of independence for all. These issues cannot be ignored, for as Eleanor Roosevelt said, staying aloof is a cowardly evasion, courage is more exhilarating than fear, and in the long run, it is easier. We must also shift our gaze away from the immediate gratification of today and toward the unselfish outlook of tomorrow. There's a Greek proverb that must become the meditation of our heart. A society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. For all our shortcomings and for all the plans denied and deferred in 2020, the experiment begun five years ago under Independence for All, carried out so imperfectly and so unevenly, is worth the fight. For even when our plans are obstructed, we know that the core values of Independence for All will always persevere we need only sustain our focus. The state of our city is strong and resilient. We are a community ready for the next chapter, and I know with the help of those in this room, our story will be great. Thank you for your time and your commitment to the City of Independence, for having me here today, and for the ongoing drive to make Independence the city we know and love.